Okay, uh, sorry, this is the uh, final uh, session uh, of the meeting. Uh, this meeting is sort of filling in a slot, which for quite a lot of years we've had meetings on uh, Mendelian randomization, and we couldn't have a meeting with Mendel in its title without having something on Mendelian randomization. And so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Eleanor Sanderson, who is also from the uh, MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit, who's going to tell us about that. Hey, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction to what Mendelian randomization is. Um, just sort of, so we it's really all, almost always abbreviated to MR, um, and so I'll probably use that abbreviation quite a lot. And the other one is um, instrumental variables, which tend to get abbreviated to IV because otherwise these are two long mouthful words that um, we just sent to. Um, yeah, always abbreviate. So, um, and starting, I'm going to start by sort of stepping away from genetics for a slide and um, talking more about sort of epidemiology. Um, and within epidemiology, we really want to try and understand um, what causes different health outcomes. So we can see what's associated with things um, by we measure data, look at associations between different traits. Um, but if we really want to act on particular traits to try and improve health outcomes for people, we need to know what causes them. So if we observe an association between two phenotypes, um, X and Y, this could be because X causes Y. But it could also be because Y causes X. Um, or it could just be that there's something else that is causing both of those traits. Only if A is true, would sort of changing X, doing something to X, change Y. So would like lowering people's, the population's BMI lead to a lower risk of a certain type of cancer. Um, if they're just associated because it's driven by something else, um, then acting on BMI isn't going to actually cause any change in the outcome. And that's really sort of for public health and epidemiology, this is a really fundamental question that we're trying to get at. So why am I talking about this to you at a conference about mental? Um, well, we can use this um, random assortment um, of the alleles at, at um, gamete formation and conception, as a form of randomization. Um, so for given what your parents have, what you get from your mum and what you get from your dad is random. And what you get from your mum is also completely independent of what you get from your dad. So which combination of alleles you get is randomly determined. Um, and when those alleles are associated. So we just had this great talk from Jib about um, finding these small variations that are actually associated with traits in these big sizes. Um, when we see that association, we can use that variation to help us understand whether X, our exposure, say BMI, um, actually causes the outcome or not. So we've got our um, X and Y that are possibly confounded, possibly causal. Um, and we can take the genetic variants that are associated with X and use that to sort of obtain a, a value of the exposure that is independent of that confounding. And that can be used to then estimate a, a causal effect. Um, and it's an estimate, it's a statistical approach. Um, and in practice, we use this approach called um, instrumental variables. So instrumental variables is a statistical method that's been sort of widely used in economics over the last sort of 20 or 30 years. Um, it relies on three assumptions that your genetic variant here, uh, this is our genetic variant. So your instrumental variable, which is here a genetic variant is associated with the exposure you're interested in. Um, and that it's, this is, that's the first assumption which is called relevance. Um, that there's no other trait that confounds your outcome and that 
um, instrument or genetic variant that you're using, and that there's no other pathway from genetic variant to the outcome. Plus another really important assumption, which is that changing your exposure via um, a variation through genetics is equivalent to um, an environmental change. I'll come back to that, sort of illustrate that with an example in a minute. Um, in practice, you implement it with, um, either we can have individual level data where you've got um, loads of a set of people and you've got their genome-wide summary statistics, you've got um, measures of the exposure and the outcome. <coughs> in practice, that's quite difficult because these genetic variants we're using um, as Jib discussed, they, they explain a really tiny variation um, in proportion variation in the exposure. Um, but they, that means you need really, really big sample sizes to get, like, actually estimate this. So we use those summary statistics um, to actually, we can use summary statistics from GWAS studies that Jib just talked about to really, to get at, um, at whether or not um, that causal effect. Won't go into the stats of how we actually do that. Um, it's like side point, there's a lot of history in this conference. So See All Right was, um, we've heard him mentioned a few times, oh, he was a geneticist. He was um, quite involved in developing um, path analysis, I believe. Um, this is his dad, who is Philip Wright, who was an economist who wrote this book, which is almost certainly as boring as the title makes it sound. <laughs> um, in the appendix of this book, he wrote a quite um, the first sort of exposition of instrumental variables. This was back in the 1920s. Um, so it really wasn't picked up for a long time after that. But again, but it was the first sort of exposition of instrumental variable analysis. It, um, but it's a lot more mathematical than anything else Philip Wright wrote. So there's been a lot of speculation for a long time that actually maybe Seal Wright had written it. Um, Recent analysis has shown that it was actually written by Philip Wright, but developed the idea, their family then provided some letters more recently that showed them developing the ideas via letter. Um, so Seal Wright was sort of instrumental in the development of IV estimation. Um, and IV then sort of, um, it was too mathematically complicated to be heavily implemented at the time, was picked up again in the 50s, and then again in like the 70s and 80s was when it started becoming sort of well-established in economic literature. And then um, in MR, George wrote a great paper, which I don't have a picture of, but in 2003, um, proposing Mendelian randomization. And it was only sort of after that, that the link between the two um, became sort of really obvious. Um, and I think, yeah, I find it very interesting because I've come from the instrumental variables to, side to working on MR, but um, I think it's quite uh, interesting how these different ideas appear separately and then combine back in together. Um, so what would be an example of um, instrumental, of MR in practice? So this is quite an interesting example. Um, we're looking here at whether HDL cholesterol lowers coronary heart disease. So this is, for those of you who don't know much about epidemiology, HDL is a type of cholesterol, coronary heart disease is something you don't really want to get. Um, observationally, they've been negatively associated, even when, um, and that's even true, associate, um, sort of adjusting for other types of lipids and cholesterols, like that was quite, seemed quite a robust observational association. So it became sort of widely accepted that or accepted that there was this um, sort of protective cholesterol. Cholesterol is normally bad for your heart, um, and it was seen as being maybe sort of strangely. This one was actually the good cholesterol. Um, at then a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials were done on this, and at about the same time as they were all being published, and they were expensive, long trials that cost a lot of money to run, involve, um, you know, take years to actually complete. Um, about as they were completing, enough data was becoming available to also do an MR analysis. And both showed absolutely no, or no effect 
of cholesterol on um, CHD. So it's sort of showing how we can use, this is really bringing it back to Mendel, it's like how we can use that random variation and our understanding of the random variation in genetics to bring information into other fields and into trying to understand causal effects within healthcare. Um, and so I said, I bring it back to the gene environment equivalence. This is why it's really important and easier to illustrate with an example, like your SNPs are only associated showing what I've put here with the HDLG of the genetically predicted variation in HDL. Um, but the confounders are affecting sort of everything else. And what you see is everything. And so we're assuming that those genetic variants are um, varying HDL through the genetic variants is equivalent to the confounders varying it, other environmental influences coming in on the um, variants. And that is quite an important assumption for taking the results you see from MR forward to um, sort of thinking about what their implications for public health are. Um, but one sort of obvious issue that comes up when we think about um, MR and genetics and gene types is that, well, genetics are pretty fixed. They're definitely fixed before you're born. Um, but you're, the traits we're looking at, in, you know, they vary across your lifetime, potentially quite substantially. Um, your BMI can fluctuate on a sort of annual basis, maybe other things on shorter terms, longer times, but you know, you're not expecting many of the traits that you're interested in when we're trying to understand causal effects in healthcare aren't fixed across your lifetime. Um, and there's two sort of ways that that could be happening. It could be that the effects of the genetic variants are fixed. They have a fixed sort of association with the trait across your lifetime. You imagine that as a sort of underlying level and then it's just all the other confounders that change across your life that are having varying effects on your phenotype that is sort of observed. So you've got base sort of genetically predicted BMI, and then it's, it's everything else that is causing, um, or some subset of everything else that is causing the variation, the fluctuations you see within a person over their lifetime. But the other possibility is that actually the association between the genetic variants and the phenotype aren't fixed across your lifetime. So maybe at different times, there's different sort of genes or genetic variants that are more or less important, or have bigger or smaller effects on that phenotype for that. Um, and if that's true, if we could show that that's true, we could then use that to actually estimate the effects of that phenotype across different points in your lifetime. Um, and so this great paper by Tom Richardson, we did that um, and we applied a sort of what we call multivariable Mendelian randomization, which is it's MR, but with more than one exposure. And it's normally used with two related exposures, but in this case, rather than looking at two related exposures, we looked at um, a measure of childhood adiposity and a measure of adulthood adiposity. So this is the same phenotype, so you're fainting at different time points. Um, we took some data from UK Biobank that had um, asked participants how sort of their measures of adiposity in childhood and measured it in adulthood and then ran this genome-wide association study to pick up what sort of what level of genetic variants we saw associated with each um, at each of those two age points. And we get this as a plot that helpfully Jeb described what these mean, but um, what these are the sort of genetic points where we found that were associated with um, either one of those two traits. So in the top, we've got childhood adiposity, um, Everything in yellow in this plot is more strongly associated with childhood adiposity than it is adulthood adiposity. Everything marked in blue is more strongly associated with um, adulthood adiposity. And there's a few gray hits where um, these long gray lines, um, and that's where they were associated, but with both to about the same level. Um, and what 
we can sort of take from this is that there are a lot of varied points on the genome, a lot of different genetic variants that are much more strongly associated with childhood adiposity. And there are another set that are associated with adult, more strongly associated with adulthood adiposity. And for many of them, they are actually sort of what we consider as genome-wide significantly associated with both, just that how strongly they associate with one or other um, differs at these two time points that we've measured. Um, so we went on to try and estimate the effect of adiposity at each of the different time points, so at childhood um, and in adulthood. Um, and we took some GWAS outcome data that didn't um, overlap. So this is just, um, and this is sort of what we found for three different outcomes. So we first looked at coronary heart disease and we showed that if you just looked at childhood BMI levels or adiposity, you see like a strong um, increasing effect of BMI when you're, not BMI, adiposity when you're a child on your risk of coronary heart disease when you are sort of in later life. Um, but once we put that in trying to adjust for each of childhood and adulthood effects and accounting for that different genetic effect at each time point, that um, childhood effect just disappears completely. So we only see that effect in childhood on coronary heart disease because likely there's a pathway through your childhood BMI affecting your adulthood BMI to the outcome, but also because there is overlap in the genetic variants that are associated with both, um, as we saw on the previous slide. Um, we see very similar results for type 2 diabetes. So um, essentially means being having higher adiposity in childhood doesn't raise your risk of type 2 diabetes if it's not maintained into adulthood. Um, we see the opposite effect for breast cancer, um, where the higher, the sort of pr actually protective effect of higher adiposity in um, childhood remains and any effect in adulthood, but we don't see any sort of ongoing effect in adulthood in these models. And there's a lot of hypothesis, a lot of ongoing work to sort of explain that mechanism um, and sort of more recent papers, but that's sort of a few ideas, but it's not fully understood exactly why we see that effect now. But we're really strongly showing that it's childhood is what matters in that case. Um, but these all mean to that, despite the fact that your genetic variants are fixed and your phenotype varies, you can still use MR to pick up different um, effects at different time points if the genetic variants have differing associations with that trait. And I've shown results for BMI because that's the one trait at the moment where we've had big enough samples to show that that really does happen. And I think for many traits, what you're actually estimating is an entire lifetime effect of the genetic variants. And the variation in the phenotype is gonna be due to external variation, confounded um, other environmental influences. But for, um, so for BMI, we can certainly to try and unpick these two effects. Um, now, I sort of said at the beginning, oh yeah, conditional on your parents, the genetic variations you get are random and then have just brushed over the fact that we've just been using, we use full population data and we do put controls in it to try and control for that population drift and control for that, um, uh, you know, sort of patterns in population structure that if they correlate with patterns of phenotypes by chance, which as sort of traits of behaviors and lifestyles also differ across the world, you would expect some correlations to occur by chance. Um, so we'd like to be able to do family data. We, it was first proposed, George's 2003 paper suggested that it should be done using family data, but at the time there just was not any data that could be applied for MR with families. Um, the genetic effects we are talking about here, and we're using lots and lots of genetic variants often, um, but they are having tiny, tiny effects on these phenotypes. Sadly, it's not the clear sort of 
P trait type size effects. It is these things, each variant, if they explain 0.001% of the variation in a trait, that's quite a lot. Um, so we need really, really big sample sizes to um, do this. Um, but we do now starting to be able to get those sort of sample sizes. And we're starting to do some work with family level data to try and understand how, um, what, whether these biases are like, um, yeah, start being able to look at things at family level, understand if, if our approximation to the population is, is okay. Um, and I've just pulled out a couple of results out of this paper. I'm afraid there's a lot of like, lines on this, but um, I've highlighted them a bit. So first of all, this is a paper that looked at a few different within family studies, took siblings from a few different data sets across Europe um, and looked at the difference between siblings. So there the randomization is true because these are people who had share both parents, the same both parents. So any differences between siblings have to have then occurred by chance. Um, and sort of an example trait that really sort of fits very well is looking at the effect of BMI on type two diabetes, where this is the observational association that's what you see if you just look at the correlation between the traits. If you apply MR with population level data, you get a slightly stronger effect. Um, and if you use the siblings, well, the confidence intervals goes up a lot because your sample size goes down a lot because we have a lot more data on populations than we do um, siblings, but you get the same, um, very much the same effect. Um, and now I'm going to end on an example where that sadly does doesn't happen. Um, so now we looked at the effect of BMI on education. And you get using the observational data, you see this protective effect of BMI on education. So this is saying if you increase BMI, your education, not protective, negative effect. Um, if you increase BMI, your education level decreases. Um, that in population level MR results, that effect doesn't attenuate. Um, it's quite imprecise, but it still remains. Um, if you look between siblings, it disappears completely. And that's because I think in this example, the population, that assumption that by adding some population controls, we are absorbing all of that variation um, doesn't necessarily hold. Um, interestingly, if you do these two the other way around, education does have a causal effect on BMI and the result actually is fairly consistent. Um, so it's not true that for every social, sort of more social, less biologically proximal trait, MR is biased by population structure, but it's certainly in those sort of, it seems to be that in those sorts of traits, it becomes more of a problem. Thanks.